Right. So let's talk a little bit about those rules. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of your work through Aleph Beta online and also on uh, your, your books that you've written on some different biblical themes. Um, I'm trying to understand what, what uh, sort of impressed me and made me so curious is how, how have you found these things within the text? So there's a few questions to ask here. The first one is, um, you know, what is the way in which what is your methodology for reading the text? What are the precursors, if there are, for this style? What's new about it? And then the second question is, well, why haven't we found some of these amazing insights? Already? Why haven't they already been sort of noted or written by our ancient commentators? And I guess a third question as well to pack into this is, how can we know whether we've read something into the text that wasn't actually there or whether we've actually revealed um, an authentic meaning? Okay, so to, to really answer those questions would take a while, but let's take uh, one at a <laughs> Sorry time. Sorry to throw them all at you. It's okay. Um, what are some of the rules, right? That was your sort of your first question. Yeah. Uh, and your second question was, um, how is it that we've come up with seeing things before that sort of haven't been seen? Right. Um, So to some extent, I want to argue that the methodology which I'm expressing is not really a new methodology, but an actually an ancient methodology. And to some extent, it's the most ancient methodology that we have. If you go back to the earliest, um, to the earliest kinds of commentary on the Torah, before what's known as the Achronim, the medieval scholars, before the Rishonim, what might comfortably be called the Dark Ages or the Late Dark Ages, right before all of that, Right in in antiquity, uh, you had the midrash, right? And the midrash is you know, five six hundred, you know, uh, A.D. or B.C.E. or whatever you call it, um, where really the rabbis of the Talmud are grappling with the text. Now we were talking before about uh, the Talmud, and the Talmud is fund when most people think of the Talmud, they're thinking most fundamentally of what's known as halachic drash, which is expounding the biblical text in a halachic way, in a legal way. But there's also a kind of agadic drash, which is expanding the biblical text to understand its ideas, to understand its mm. narratives better. And midrash, again, is something which typically gets ignored. And the reason why it gets ignored is because, it's diff again, midrash is difficult to understand. Mm. My argument at its core, and you can see this by watching, you know, Aleph Beta videos, is that, is that midrashic analysis is really kind of using... Um, the, the, the themes and ideas and the rules which I'm articulating in a deep kind of way. I don't think I'm articulating anything new. I think I'm revealing the structure of Midrash. And um, you can see it when you come across a strange Midrash and it doesn't seem to make any sense to you. And uh, you then look back at the biblical text and if you begin to sort of apply a rigorous methodology in looking at the text, all of a sudden it clicks and it's like, that's what the Midrash is talking about. Mm. Uh, and it, it's, it's fascinating because you can sort of go both ways. Sometimes you can start with this puzzling midrash and not understand what it's talking about, look at the biblical text carefully, and then it clicks. Sometimes you do the analysis, and you look at the biblical text, and you find these subcurrents and these themes underneath the surface, and then and you wonder, how come I'm the first person who ever saw this? And then you stumble across this midrash, and it's like, I'm not the first person who ever saw mm. this, right? There, there were others who saw this uh, earlier. Um, and midrashic analysis goes back, you know, to very, very early times. I'll give you an example of this to kind of take it out of the air and, and, um, and again, give you a little bit of sense of the methodology and a little bit of sense of what I'm talking about with, with uh, anticipating medrash. Um, my argument is that the medrash itself, to some extent, is playing off of biblical analysis because one of the key points of, of the methodology which I'm articulating is that the really earliest commentaries on the Bible is not actually the rabbis in the Medrash. The real earliest commentaries on the Bible is actually the Bible itself. The, and that seems counterintuitive. How can the Bible be commenting on itself? But the, I guess one of the most fundamental aspects of the methodology that I'm arguing for is the assumption that the Bible is commenting on itself. Basically, my argument is, is that the Bible is the original internet, as it were. If you think about what the internet is, its power comes from the interconnectedness of its information. You might want, not want to say that in some religious circles. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The internet gets a bad name, right? But I'm not saying it's the internet in terms of the content of the internet, but the power.
power of the internet right. is the ability to interconnect and interweave information. It's interesting that I'm old enough to remember Al Gore when Al Gore, back in the 90s when he was running for president, before the internet was really fully developed, talked about it as an information superhighway. Mm -hmm. And we've since discarded that kind of term because it's too linear. That it's not an information superhighway in terms of this thing that goes straight, but it's an internet, it's a net, it's a, it's, it's a web, it's a worldwide web. Mm -hmm. And the ways we speak of the internet emphasize the interconnectedness of the information. What would, internet connect, what would interconnected information look like without electronics, right? What would hyperlinks look like without electronics, where you can't just sort of mouse over your cursor over this little blue thing and get somewhere else? What would it look like in a black and white text written with a quill on ink? What it would look like is intertextuality, which is one of the main so, you know, fundamentals that we work with in, in Alafeda, which is that every once in a while you're reading a text and you come across this, this strange word, language, phrase that reminds you of some other strange word, phrase mm -hmm. that appears elsewhere. And you have to be careful with this because a, a, a non-practice practitioner of this can uh, spin all sorts of nonsense out of it. But um, it, it's not simply that the word uh, said uh, or he said appears here and appears there, right? right. It's, it's an unusual turn of phrase. Like in, uh, in Shira Shiram, for example, there's this phrase at one of the climactic moments of the Song of Songs, which is a, 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 this, it's an allegorical story of love between a man and a woman, where uh, the woman sort of unintentionally, or perhaps intentionally, causes distress to her, to her male lover. And uh, in so doing, he's knocking on the door. And she says, ah, why do I have to get out of bed? I already took off my coat, I'm undressed, I'm in bed, I, I don't want to dirty my feet and get up to open the door. And she insults him, but the language for that is pashatati et kutanti echacha al bashama. Now if you listen to that language, it's rich with, um, with intertextual allusions to other points in Tanakh, two in particular. First of all, pashatati et kutanti, I've stripped myself off of my coat. Well, there's only one other time in Tanakh that you have the language of someone stripping a coat off of themselves. Right. It's the story of Joseph and his brothers. What's the story of Joseph and his brothers doing in the middle of Shira Shirim? It doesn't, right, in the, in the Song of Songs, but it's there, and it's remarkable. And once you see that, you begin to see that there's other aspects of Shira Shirim right over there that's also referencing, of all things, the Joseph and his brother's story. For example, the next thing the woman says is, Rachatzti et raglie chacha and tanfem. I've washed my feet how can I possibly um, how can I possibly uh, dirty them by, by going up to open the mm. door and if you think about Joseph what do we know about the pit that he was thrown into it says something about the pit Haborek, the pit was empty Ain Bomayim, it didn't have any water in it. Well, if you go feet first into an empty pit, what happens to your feet? Your feet get dusty. So right after there's this reference to getting your, your coat stripped off of you and thrown in a pit, there's this reference to these dusty feet of Joseph as if I don't have his dusty feet. And, and these things pile up one after another after another. And at a certain point, after there's 10 or 11 or 12 references to the Joseph story mm -hmm. surreptitiously hidden in the text, you have to ask yourself, is this a coincidence? Is this just my imagination? Or is the author of the Bible intending to overlay that text? And when I talk about the Bible being its own commentary, what it's really saying is that, is that the Torah is saying, if you want to understand text A, you can't really understand text A without reference to text B. Mm. Look at text B, overlay it in text A, mm. take the Joseph story, uh, almost like with a physical transparency, just plop it down mm. on the Song of Songs and see one story sort of um, enlighten another to get to the point of... But can I just pause you yeah. for a second? But So when you see, I mean, I guess it's probably you're, it's going to link to the next question which I asked. If you see, it's one thing to say, okay, I, I see a link between this part of uh, the Bible and that part of the Bible. But it's another thing to be able to say, right, this is what the link means. Yes. And how can you know whether that is accurate or not? Absolutely. And you don't. Right? There's a, and that's a very... So you're always very, saying perhaps. Yes, yes, you're always saying perhaps. And it's, by the way, it's very similar to science, right? Mm -hmm. And so how does science work? There's two parts to science. There's evidence gathering, and then there's interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, I can have an experiment, and I can find all of this evidence, and the question is, what does the evidence mean? What does the data mean? Mm -hmm. So I can show you data and now interpret the data. And at that point, a practice scientist has to be able to sort of make a leap and say, this is what the most conservative interpretation of the data seems like to me. Mm -hmm. But scientists can argue about that. 
Mm -hmm. And hence, the arguments that emerge in science, right? That is a legitimate argument to say, yes, I see that something is going on, right? But given everything else that's going on, right, and, and, and the questions that we have, I would discount that possibility and go towards this possibility. And that's a legitimate argument you have, but it's an argument waged on a certain battlefield upon an acceptance of evidence. And basically, all I'm saying to a reader is, is accept this evidence, right? And there was, don't ignore it. And I was, if you're reading the Song of Songs, be aware that that this is out there. Don't ignore it, mm -hmm. and and try to account for it somehow. And if you can account for it in a responsible way, then you have a theory as to some of the marvelous inner layers of meaning that may be going on. Mm. Um, but again, I I think one of the keys is and and is is basically intellectual honesty. And I think one of the things that a responsible practitioner of this methodology, or really a responsible learner of Torah has to do, is to say that, um, what am I doing when I'm learning Torah? Am I using the Torah as a hook for my own ideology, or am I seeking to discover what's in it? If I look at the Torah as a hook for my own ideology, then I say, I have certain preconceived notions about what I want the Torah to, to teach. I'm teaching... Uh, ninth grade. I would love it if my ninth graders had an inspiring lesson today about Lush and Hara and the evils of, of the evil tongue right. and of gossip. Right. So I'm going to look at this and I'm going to pound that, that round peg into the square hole and by, you know, and one way or the other I'm going to get this text to come up with some sort of lesson about Lush and Hara and that's one way you can do it. And where you can say in a more subtle way, uh, my parents got divorced. I never spent any quality time with my kids, right? So now let me look in, in the Torah with all that baggage and try to see other people who didn't spend any time with their kids. Oh, Abraham. Abraham's willing to sacrifice Isaac. I bet it's because he didn't spend enough time playing basketball with them, just like me. So it's another way of using your own baggage right. and imposing on the text. But there is another way to do it. The other way to do it is a scientist where I say, no, I leave my baggage at the door. Mm -hmm. It's not about me. It's about what is the Torah really trying to say. Mm. Let me enter its world. Look at this. I never expected to find a whole set of parallels in Shira Shirim to the Joseph story. And it's not just the Joseph story. Echacha, right? Two, two verses. With, uh, right? the, 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 the word Echacha appears four times in the entire Hebrew Bible, twice in this verse. The only other two times it appears is uh, actually also in the same verse, tucked away in the ninth chapter of the book of Esther. Now, is that a coincidence? Only two times, right? I mean, it's two and two. Mm -hmm. These are the only times it ever appears. Clearly, Esther is evoking Shira Shirim. So you mm -hmm. can't read that verse in Esther without understanding that its author is talking about Shira Shirim. So what is Esther saying right. about Shira Shirim? Now, you can ignore that, but, but you've got to sort of open yourself up to that and say, I don't know. I, I never expected to find that. Uh, uh, forget Lashonara. Like, what's the Bible actually teaching me? Right. And then, and if you look at it in that way, uh, something I think remarkable emerges, which is if you're willing to leave your baggage at the door, if you're willing to come to the Bible without preconceived notions of what you want it to teach and let it teach you things, it will teach you remarkable, mind blowing things that you never will have expected to learn. And that's, uh, I think, fascinating. Well, you talk about sort of superimposing your own agenda onto how you read the Bible and the text itself. How do we deal with this issue of the fact that there are many occurrences in the Bible where there is a plain meaning of the text, and yet the oral uh, interpretation, the rabbinic interpretation that we've had, um, is sort of is different to what the plain meaning of the text is. For example, I, an eye for an eye. There are some people who would argue that actually it was meant literally, and then it, the, the rabbis changed it, and or they the, you say there's or some people say no, it was always this way. It was always to do with monetary matters, not literally. There are other people who talk about the fact that the rabbi Rabbi Sachs speaks in his book not in God's name about how the rabbis uh, wrote in the Talmud that the we we don't uh, want to learn from the way in which the Jews conquered the land of Israel. We're going to shift have a sort of paradigm shift in that. Regards, and some people would say that was a shift of ethics and shift of reading the text. Some people would say no, actually, it was always understood this way. It was just, and they try. So, so how do we make sense of the fact that there does seem to be a difference in terms of interpretation between the plain meaning and the way the the, the rabbinic uh, authorities have 
um, understood it? And do you believe that actually things have changed and evolved in interpretation, or actually it's always, it's always, the oral tradition has always been the same in the way we've interpreted the, the, the meaning of the text? Well, first of all, the Torah is dynamic. Even the oral tradition is dynamic. There is no static oral tradition. The oral tradition is full of debate and and develops over time. So I don't know if, if, it, if it is helpful to talk about um, if it was always a certain way. But what I will say is that I think that the... Well, like the, an eye for an eye. Was right. It? I think the oral Torah and the written Torah are trying to do two different things. And the larger truth emerges from some sort of mysterious mix of both of them. The approach that I take is kind of one that was pioneered a little bit, or at least articulated, I think, well by in Hebrew by uh, Rabbi Yehuda Cooperman of blessed memory, the the, the uh, rabbi who's the founder of Mechlala. He wrote a book called Chut Shamikra, which is sort of devoted towards really the question you've asked, which is how does the pshat, the simple meaning of the text, live in a world of oral law. We have a video on Aleph Data which kind of articulates an approach to that, or which really is Rabbi Cooperman's approach, although I regret sort of not having mentioned him in that video. So we'll use this as the opportunity <laughs> to give him credit uh, for the thought. Those who want to look up the video on Aleph Data, you can find it at alephbeta.org in our second year of Parsha videos and Parsha. Yeah, we'll put a link. You can put a link. You <laughs> can put a link in, into it. Uh, but essentially, the argument that I made there is that. Um, one finds a consistent thing uh, when you look at uh, the sort of Talmudic legal analysis of the Torah and you look at the language of the Torah itself, um, which is that the Torah will often articulate things in terms of a broader ideal without paying that much attention in the written law as to the actual expression of the ideal. Um, I mean, to give you, I, I can give you examples all night about this. Uh, uh, one might look at Parshat Shoftim, for example, uh, in Sefer Dvarim, as a political constitution for the Jewish people. In a way, it is a constitution. It talks about different kinds of leaders. It talks about the Kohen, the priest. It talks about the Navi. It talks about the prophet. It talks about the, the king. And, um, and it gives um, rules for each of these. Uh, these are the rules for the Kohanim of what they can take from the people and what they can't. These are the rules for the king. Um, these are the rules of whether a, a, a Navi, a prophet, is a false prophet or a not false prophet. And to some extent you could argue, yes, that's a, that's a constitution of the people, but it's not. Because the one thing that the Bible does not articulate expressly is the nature of the relationship between these institutions. How do they check and balance each other? How do they actually live together? Mm. If you actually look carefully, you'll find that there's a book in the Bible in which these three different types of leaders emerge as possible paradigms. And it's almost as if Jewish history is playing out in reality mm. the various different possibilities of the interpretation of Parshat Shoftim, and history is going to be the judge of which emerges. Mm. And so the book I'm, of the Bible I'm talking about is Sefer Shmuel the book of Samuel. If you look at the book of Samuel, how the book of Samuel opens, what's the dominant form of leadership? It's Ailey. Well, what kind of leader is Ailey? Right? Ailey is a Kohen. Um, and, and Ailey wants his children to take over. And there's the possibility that the kahuna will be the dominant, that the priesthood will be the dominant paradigm, is the dominant paradigm, and if his children take over, will continue to be the dominant paradigm, but his children can't take over because they're corrupt, and a new type of leadership emerges, and not just a new leader, but a different kind of leader. It's Samuel, and the Samuel is a prophet, right? And for a while, there's a chance that that will become the dominant paradigm. Samuel is the guy in charge. He'd very much like it for his sons to take over, but his sons are corrupt, and that doesn't work out. Right? Enter a new kind of leadership, a king. Now, what's the common denominator in all these kinds of leaders? They're the ones that were talked about in Sefer Shoftim. It's almost as if history is working out the paradigm. How are these things going to relate? How is this new king, Saul, going to relate to the prophet in his life? And, and how does that play out? And the Talmud pays attention to some of that and is, and is, is sort of dynamically interpreting that and is, is, is responding to how history develops and is attempting to encode that, uh, you know, for future generations. Um, so there, there's a fascinating and mysterious kind of interplay between uh, the, the, uh, the biblical world and the rabbinic world. Cooperman's argument in, um, in Pshutol Shemikra is basically that at its core, 
the Bible is seeking to do a different thing than the Talmud is doing. The Talmud is a particular kind of interpretation of the Bible. Remember, the Bible's the core. Everything else is interpretation. There's many different ways of interpreting the Bible. Talmudic halachic interpretation is one kind of drash, but not the only kind of drash. I mentioned to you all before that there's agadic drash, which is moral exposition, which is different than legal exposition. Mm. It's the same way that if you have a profession, right, different professions will look upon life differently, mm. right? So if you decide to be a lawyer, you have a certain view of life, Go right? For, for, for you, everything is, 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 you know, what are your rights? What are your responsibilities? And that's how I come and I look at things. If I'm a psychologist, then it's, well, you know, what are you feeling? What was your past like? What's your relationship like? What are your relationships like with this? What are your relationships like with that? If I'm a sociologist, right, how did your society sort of um, uh, influence the way that Ali Anisfeld sees the world? We ask different questions of things based upon where our interest comes from. The Talmud is just one kind of way. It's just one perspective of interpreting the Talmud. It never claims to be more than that. It's the legal perspective. So you have to ask yourself, you have to ask yourself well, there's a role for legal, legality in the world. Mm. Legality is important, but it's not the be and all and end all. And it goes back mm. to a point that I made to you before, which is that to some extent, one of the things which I think we have, one of the difficulties we have in Orthodox Judaism is that we have sort of, um, to some extent, overemphasized the Talmud to the uh, right, it's, it's very, very important, but it's not the be all and end all. It's not the only way to interpret biblical text. Mm. There's uh, Jewish tradition admits of many others. There's mystical interpretation of text. There is remez, right? There is the there, there's a, a quasi mystical interpretation of text. There's moral interpretation of text. There's simple interpretation of text, and the text lives in all of these different kinds of interpretations. Why? I think the answer is because life is rich. And in order to live a rich life, you have to have some sort of law that animates your life. So the legal part of things, right, the law and order, that's part of what it means to live. So the Talmud has to come and articulate and say, what does this mean in the legal sphere? Mm. But to say that the legal sphere is the be all and end all in, mm. interpreting, in interpreting the text simply isn't true. Mm. There is a larger meaning of the text, a moral meaning of the text, a relationship meaning. If I'm a psychologist, what is the text telling me in terms of relationships? So if I have lo tevash al gadi b'chalevi mo, so the halachic interpretation of do not boil a kid in its mother's milk may be I don't eat cheeseburgers, and may be that I can't, don't cook meat and milk together, together, but that doesn't exhaust the meaning of the text. A moral interpretation or a relationship interpretation asks us to understand what sort of relationship do we have with food such that when we are eating, we should be thinking about milk and we should be thinking about meat such that when I'm eating them, would I, would I really want to eat them, right? Would I boil a kid in a mother's milk? It's almost as if the Torah is saying, you know, you can eat milk and you can eat meat, but where does milk come from? Mm. It doesn't come from the store, right? Where does meat come from? It doesn't come from the store, right? Meat is an animal and I have the ability to kill an animal and to bring it to my table. And that's a right that God gave me in the world, but I'm still killing an animal. There's death in the world, whether I was at the slaughterhouse or not. And what is milk? Milk is the animal's way of giving life mm. to its child. And I'm allowed to drink that too. And I can use that and I can harness that from the animal world, but I have to understand what I'm doing. I have to have some modicum of respect for the meat and some modicum of respect for the milk. And that respect demands that you wouldn't boil the meat. You wouldn't boil a, a kid. You wouldn't kill a child, right? By boiling it in milk. If the milk is there to allow the child to live, Right? What kind of insensitivity to this to this mother's milk, to to to, to maternity in the, in the in the animal world? Are you expressing by killing the animal by doing that? And that is a non-halachic argument. There's nothing halachic about that argument, right. but it's an overriding principle that the language of the text is giving you there. So I, I I don't see it as sort of a linear dichotomy between these things as if they're in tension with each other, which wins the biblical text or the or the oral law. The biblical text is foundational. The oral law is one mm. one way of interpreting it, and there are many other ways as well. Right. But some people argue that the reason why that there is so much focus on studying the Talmud is because that's how you really understand understand the mind of God. That's an argument that is made a lot. How do you understand the legal framework of Torah? And that helps you actually understand 
uh, beyond spirituality, perhaps they're saying perhaps more so than a study of the written Torah. Do you not accept that? I'm not sure if I would accept that. I think that the, if you go back to the sources that actually make that argument of the Jewish tradition, one of them is the Nefesh HaChaim, mm -hmm. uh, Rav Chaim Velazhan. Um, but he's not talking, as far as I understand, uh, about the Talmud. He's talking about the Torah as itself. Right. The reason why the Torah as a whole is valuable is because it is a way of understanding or connecting with the mind of God. And if you think about that, that's an awesome kind of thing. Even if you go to the secular world, right? The, uh, the, uh, one of the most remarkable thing that scientists uh, find uh, just absolutely stupefying is that uh, they argue that mathematics is the mind of God, right? And, and what's remarkable is that the mathematics that govern the universe are complicated but not too complicated that the human mind can't access. Mm. And they said that, you know, and I'm not enough of a mathematician to know that, but to, to them that's one of the greatest mysteries of the world, which is that you can imagine a universe where the math is too complicated for the human mind, short of computers to ever be able to figure out. But it's not that way. It's just tantalizingly challenging enough that if Newton and Leibniz come around and figure out uh, calculus, all of a sudden it begins to make sense. Mm. And all of a sudden you can plot an orbit to the moon. And all of a sudden you can understand how, how orbits work and how and the science behind Kepler's uh, and Galileo's understandings of things. And it, it's almost as if God is teasing us and <laughs> saying, you know, I, you know, use your mind because your mind can connect with my mind. Mm. Mathematics is one of the ways it happens. The natural world in general is another way it happens as we under, begin to understand the secrets of biology, when we begin to understand the secrets of chemistry. Um, I once had a chat with a doctor who was in medical school. I said, did he ever just stop and just be awed at just the, the function of a cell? You're looking at cells under electron microscopes where every atom is the size of a tennis ball and, and, and the whole thing is the size of New York City and the, the manufacturing capacity of the cell dwarfs that of the eastern hat seaboard of the United States and that's one cell. Does that over overwhelm you? And it's like, yeah, you know, you never really think of it that way yeah. in medical school, but it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the truth. And so God put forward, um, you know, one of the ways, one of the ways we connect to God, not the only way, is through our intellect and by being able to um, play hide and go seek with him in terms of these, these little mm -hmm. clues and these little pieces in the world that he's put out for us, chemistry, biology, all of these disciplines, and one of them is Torah, mm. right? He's given us this law, and, um, and it's a way to connect with them. It's not the oral law. It's not the written law. It's, it, it's, it's the Torah in all of its shapes and the forms. The sum of its parts. In, in, in all of the sum of its parts. And if you think about the Shema, really we were talking a little bit off camera about the Shema, but if you think about the Shema, the, the fundamental imperative of the first paragraph of the Shema is a love of God, and then the implications of love and of a God. And if you just think about what the Shema actually says, just listen to the the basic words of the text: You shall love God. How? With all of your heart, with all of your soul. It should be a passionate love. What does a passionate love look like? These things that I command you today, right? How should you relate to them? Now, before I even translate the end of that verse, if I would just start a verse by saying, these things that I command you today, and you are my subject, how should you relate to them? What would be the logical answer? If I'm commanding you to do things, your job is? To listen. To listen and to obey. But listen to the actual end of the verse. These things that I command you today should be should be on your heart. You should have an emotional relationship to them. Fascinating. I'm not just asking obedience from you. I'm asking for something else. You should actually care about what it is that I'm commanding you. you. It should matter to you. Emotionally, it should matter to you. Not just intellectually, but you should care. Why? Because if you love God, then one of the things he gave you, who is God? God is this mysterious being. You can't touch him. You can't feel him. You can't see him. How do you reach out? He's the ultimate extraterrestrial, right? And if you think about all the movies that talk about extraterrestrials, right? There's the scary movies that talk about extraterrestrials, right? The, the ones written by directors who, who grew up on vengeful gods. They, so the vengeful extraterrestrial, the Terminator who comes to the world. And then there's the Steven Spielberg movies with E.T. with the warm and fuzzy 
uh, extraterrestrials, right? But one of the challenges with all extraterrestrial movies is like, but how do I understand this being? They don't speak English. They, they, they don't come from my world. How could I even interact? My senses, if you think about what a sense is, all of our senses are adapted for interacting with terrestrial phenomena. Right? I see things. I see physical things. I can touch them. I can feel them. I can, I can taste them. They're not adapted for extraterrestrial contact, for, for beings that don't live within space and time. So how am I supposed to relate to God? So God says, you know what? One of the ways we can relate is I put stuff in this world. You can figure me out a little bit. Right? My mind is in this world. It's there with chemistry. It's there with biology. And it's there in the Torah, a kind of moral it, right, this this is my diary. I, I'm writing this down. This is how you come to understand me. This is how you can begin to to enter into my mind, plummet steps, and it's a remarkable book. And you discover it's a book like no other book, and it, and it, and it's marvelous. And if you do that, then you may find yourself commanded by it. And yes, you will obey, but you'd fall in love with that book if you loved someone mm. and they and you had a hard time understanding them, but you were compelled to love them nevertheless, and they were your creator, and you, you wanted to know them, and then they died, and they, they were off in heaven, and you couldn't reach out to them and touch them, and they weren't in space and time anymore, but they left you a book, right? And they said, read this. This is me. How would you feel about that book? So the book might say, I want you to do certain things, and that's all very nice. I'll do them, but I have an emotional connection to that book. That book matters to me, and if that book matters to me, then I'm going to teach it to my kids. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it wherever I am. I'm going to talk about it at home. I'm going to talk about it on the way. I'm going to talk about it in the morning when I wake up. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to make you nauseous talking about the book. It's going to be the first thing when I wake up. It's going to be the last thing when I go to bed. I'm going to be obsessed. I'm just that. That's the kind of passionate connection mm. to the Torah, which the Bible, is, which 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 God is is trying to sort of cultivate within us. You asked before about the oral law and the written law and the dichotomy between them. It's, if you think about what I've just talked to you about, that's the, the written law. That's how the written law sees Shema. But interestingly, it's not the way the oral law sees Shema. The oral law will take that and then Stop. from a particular legal standpoint is going to take a legal slice out of that and analyze that. And it's going to seem to take all of the magic out of it mm. and all of the romance out of it. And here's what the rabbis are going to say. They're going to say, when it says that you should speak words of Torah in the morning when you first wake up and in the evening when you go to sleep, you know what that means from a legal perspective? It means that you should say Kriyat Shema, you should say these actual words of Shema, you should say them in the morning, there's a mitzvah of Kriyat Shema, you should say that them. That definitely takes the magic right? out of it. Takes, and you should say <laughs> them at some time when you wake up, and at some time right before you go to sleep, and now there's a debate, what does that really mean? How late at night? How early in the morning? How long in the morning? Is the first three hours? Before? What does it mean to get up? And, and all of a sudden, there's all these rules, and it doesn't feel so spiritual anymore, and I do that. But you know what? There is a place for law. What does law do? You see, if all you have is this overriding principle of passionate love, here's the thing with passionate love. It's very difficult to stay passionate love all the time. You fall in love with your wife. You're in the state of the throes of passion for how long? Okay, so you, you know, when you're dating. Okay, when you're engaged, first year of marriage. But how long does that intense passion last? Mm -hmm. Right? Real love somehow tends toward the mundane at a certain point. And then there's the question, what does love look like in mundane life when I'm driving carpool? What does love look like? Yeah. Right? When I, and, and at some point, the answer is that we've got to find some sort of consistent way of at least spending 15 minutes with each other, 10 minutes with each other, the way we connect in the morning, the way we connect before we go to bed, Right, the, 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 if I can look you in the eye, and and if we have rules, and that you know Tuesday night we're going to be talking for what, it, and those rules help us order our daily lives and give some kind of expression to overriding moral priorities. And again, this is sort of the the oral law and the written law at work balancing each other. Um, so uh, there is a, a mysterious kind of balance between the written and oral law, where what the written law is doing is it's articulating an ideal, right? A, an ideal that is almost like a mission statement about how you live your life. But any good, um, you know, company knows that the secret 
is, uh, is not just the mission statement, but how do you translate the mission statement into the daily life of the company? Mm -hmm. How do you translate the mission statement to the daily life of people? And to some extent, that's where law comes in. Mm -hmm. Law comes in and says, here's how I can touch that ideal, right? Here's how I can bring a piece of that ideal into my, if I say the Shema, if I say some representative word of Torah, and I at least make sure that no matter how busy my day is, at some point within three hours of waking up, I, I, I'm going to articulate a, a paragraph of Torah, then I have some way of touching that ideal of being the kind of person who's so deliriously in love in Torah that when I wake up, it's the first thing on, on my lips. Is it the whole kid and caboodle? No, but I'm on the treadmill. I'm on the way there. I'm getting there. It's an ideal that I'm striving for in my life. So I think those who say that halacha, that law is the be-all and end-all of what it takes to be a moral human being are sorely mistaken. Right? Halacha is the beginning of it. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the way the rabbis gave us a structure to mm. begin to inculcate these ideals. But you've got to look at what the ideals are. Mm. And if you don't, then you run into what the Ramban, Nachmanides, calls the very real possibility of being a manuval b'rshita Torah, which is I can keep all the laws, but I can be a disgusting human being. Because mm -hmm. if I'm not at least looking to inculcate into myself the ideals that these laws are trying to give me practice in, then I could just miss the whole boat. Yeah.